Hey everyone, it is Brian Barron, Director of Skin Care Research with Paula's Choice Skin Care coming at you from my home office in the Mitten. That would be the state of Michigan. Paula's Choice is based in Seattle and I am here almost every week on Thursday to do a hour-long live chat with our fans. And you guys um, always show up in droves, always have great questions. Today's topic is going to be eye area treatments, eye care we're going to talk eye creams, eye gels, do you need one, can you skip using one. Um, I can talk about the couple from Paula's Choice that I'm using and loving. So um, I would love to see some questions specifically about what you can do to improve uh, eye area concerns, which may or may not have to do with signs of aging. Um, but before that, uh, as I mentioned, it's December 12th and we are live. This is my. Um, this will be my last live chat for the month and for the year because as of next um, Wednesday, I'm working Monday through Wednesday next week, and then as of Thursday, I'm off for the rest of the year. Um, I have been with Paula's Choice long enough that I have um, kind of a ridiculous amount of vacation time. I'm not complaining about that, um, but I need to use it before the year is up or I will lose it. Um, not a bad problem to have, and this is a good time of year to take extra time off because a lot of other people are taking at least three or four days off on or around the holidays. So I am kind of considering this my, my holiday show. I didn't bring any Santas or Frosties or Rudolphs or Menorahs or anything like that, um, but I did want to share with you that I am a huge fan of Christmas music or holiday music. I know there's Christmas songs, there's holiday songs. I celebrate Christmas. I was raised Catholic, um, but absolutely acknowledge that there are several very important holidays that occur uh, during the month of December and, uh, and a little bit into January. So if you're so inclined, along with questions about eye area treatments, uh, eye creams and whatnot, uh, if you want to let me know which Christmas slash holiday songs uh, you really love. Um, I am one of those people, and I know a lot of others find it annoying, but when that local radio station starts playing holiday music, like right after Thanksgiving or even before it, I get excited. Um, and I have a lot of holiday-themed albums. Uh, I'm getting my son into it. He's super excited for Christmas this year. So much fun. Anyway, um, and... Some of you, um, some of you may know this, but but Christmas is the December twenty fifth is my birthday, so I will be celebrating that as well. Um, at least partially. There's other stuff planned for after Christmas that'll be more of a formal birthday celebration. But when you have a birthday on a major holiday, you get used to that. So again, not complaining. So as you guys are joining, as you're thinking of your questions for this live chat on eye area treatments and eye area concerns, let's talk about, I'm trying to think of like the best place to start with this topic. The skin around the eyes, uh, it's, it's true, you likely read this before, but it is thinner and more delicate than the skin elsewhere on the face. Um, not quite sure from a physiologic standpoint why it turned out that way. Um, the other thing that, but that factors into how quickly the eye area ages compared to the rest of facial skin and even on the neck where skin is also thin. I think one of the advantages that neck skin has to a certain degree is that the structure of our skulls and our jawline shields this part of the neck from um, overhead UV light exposure that everyone is exposed, you know, you're, if you're living in the real world, go outside, sit by a window, you're getting some amount of UV light. Uh, and most of us haven't been great every single day of our lives about using sun protection. But my, my theory is that because of that little shelf that we have, the, the central portion of the neck doesn't show sun damage quite as fast as the eye area. Um, the other thing that makes the eye area um, the first to show signs of aging, and oftentimes I'll, I'll hear from people in their um, early to mid-20s who are already seeing fine lines and wondering what to do about that. Should I get Botox as a preventive measure? On and on and on. Maybe some of you are wondering that. Um, the other thing that causes the eye area to age faster is that 
it, it this this skin is is in almost constant motion even when we're sleeping uh, you think that that skin would get a bit of a break but when you get into that um, phase of sleep known as REM sleep which the older I get the less time I think I spend in REM sleep but that's the really deeply restorative sleep and REM stands for rapid eye movement so your the skin around your eyes is moving during that phase even when you're sleeping and all of those micro movements further stress the skin around the eye and cause it to age faster. So the big question is do you need a special product for the eye area? A lot of people uh, when they start a skincare routine, they, they're, they'll get set up with their cleanser for their face, face wash, they'll pick out a moisturizer, uh, and then typically the next step, uh, unless they have another concern like breakouts uh, or excess oil, for example, their typical next purchase is an eye area product. Sadly, a lot of the eye products, whether they're labeled wrinkle cream for the eyes, eye gel, eye serum, eye treatment, a lot of them have uh, nearly indistinguishable formulas from that of facial moisturizers. Um, save for the addition of some cosmetic thickening agents to give the product a creamier texture, it really isn't that different and it really isn't tailored at all for the skin around the eyes. Now, having said that, there are some brilliant eye creams, gels, serums, treatments, however they're labeled, that do contain uh, a special mix of ingredients, ingredients that may have more research for helping the skin around the eyes, but that does not mean, of course, that they can't help skin elsewhere on the face. It's not like there's some invisible border where if you you know get your eye cream down here, it's not going to work on your cheek, but damn, it's going to work around your eyes. The same is true for a well-formulated facial moisturizer, which is still perfectly fine to use as your eye area product. Um, whether or not you do that really depends on how different the skin around your eyes is uh, in terms of dryness, signs of aging, loss of firmness, dullness, maybe you're having dark circle issues. If, if you have a laundry list of issues that are just specific to your eye area, then for the most part, I would urge you to not only put your well-formulated facial moisturizer, no matter the texture, around your eyes, but also to follow with a separate treatment-oriented product, and it can really be in whatever texture you prefer. Um, a lot of people like a gel or serum, a thinner fluid type texture for use during the day. Those textures often work very well under your daytime moisturizer with SPF. There are also eye creams with SPF that you can consider or even concealers with sunscreen, although those are fewer and farther between. Um, I feel like I'm just kind of getting a lot out all at once. So um, thank you for the birthday wish. Um, and I want, to, I want to stay on track because there's a lot to say about this topic. And I was going along the lines of... Oh, eye gels during the day and then a richer, more emollient eye area product at night. Something that you can really kind of layer on. So what I do, um, I'll share a little bit of my personal history. Um, those of you who have been uh, fans of or customers of or both Paula's Choice for a long time uh, know that for quite some time we did not have an eye cream. And some of you may or may not know the story of why we eventually did offer one and now we have four eye area products including our just launched um, Omega Plus Complex eye cream which I'll talk about in a second. But Paula had been a long time holdout on creating an eye cream for the reason I mentioned earlier, in that her logic was um, if you're using a well-formulated facial moisturizer to address your skin type of concerns on your face, it can and should be used around the eye area. You don't need a separate product. That still remains true, again, with the stipulation that you don't have a big difference in concerns for the skin. Let, let's say your goal is... Age, age prevention and some amount of visible repair from past environmental damage, okay? Maybe you've got some fine lines, some light wrinkling around the eye area, puffiness and dark circles aren't an issue, you're not really seeing loss of firmness yet, 
maybe because you're still in your 20s to early 30s, although depending on how much sun damage you've accumulated, you can certainly start seeing loss of firmness around the eyes during that time frame. Um, but in that case, if you're using an antioxidant, skin replenishing, skin restoring ingredient packed moisturizer that is a facial moisturizer with or without sunscreen, you use the sunscreen during the day, that can be applied around your eye area too and you do not need a separate product. I, that, and that's what I did for, for years. And then when we created our first eye cream, um, which is now packaged like this, the Resist Anti-Aging Eye Cream, I started using the prototype of this because one of the things that we wanted to do was create a really unique eye cream texture that was not only different from our facial moisturizers, but was also that one of the things that disappointed us, let me back up a bit, about a lot of the eye creams that we had experimented with is that they re really didn't seem to last that long. So you'd put them on at night, it would feel nice initially, and then it would kind of just go away and you wouldn't really see much of a difference or feel that lasting softness, see that line smoothing the next morning. And so a lot of the eye creams were kind of a why bother experience. Um, this one is different, it's very thick, some people say it's too thick. I get that. It's very balm-like. So if you're used to a traditional eye cream that has a thinner texture, you can see how thick that is. It's just kind of sticking there. Um, when I put this around my eyes, I dab. That's all you need to do with this. It's almost like an eye mask. And I dab it on the outer parts right through. I'm putting some on right now. Glow, 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 glow. I love this eye cream. I, I noticed a huge, huge difference after about a month or so of using this at night. Um, it it kind of helps to fill in and smooth those. I have more superficial lines around the eyes, but even if you have deeper wrinkles, this can help. Uh, and even better if you wanted to layer it with something that has uh, retinol in it, because retinol is just so fantastic for anti-wrinkle. Um, but back to the story. We did a um, large scale survey um, we hired a separate company to put this whole thing together for us. We really wanted to get a sense of what um, what our customers who had been with us for a certain amount of years were thinking of our line and what they liked, what they didn't like. And then the same um, set of questions was sent to newer Paula's Choice customers. And what we found was that I think the way the question was worded is what is um, what are what are the one or two products that you 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 use as part of your daily skincare routine that um, Paula's Choice does not offer. Ninety five percent, if I'm not mistaken, ninety five percent of respondents said that they were using an eye cream, and that just did it for Paula. She's like, you know, clearly. Every, even when they read what we, and know what we have to say about eye creams in general, and we tell them it's okay to use a facial moisturizer around their eyes, they're hedging their bets. They're hedging their bets, and I get it. Uh, and then the, the more we've delved into eye creams and looked at some of the interesting ingredient blends that can have some special benefits for skin around the eye, and again, to clarify, it is not that those ingredients wouldn't benefit skin elsewhere on the face, but they can basically come in and kind of serve as extra helpers for skin around the eye. The more we thought, you know, let's offer some eye area products. And just like anything we, we offer as far as, as part of our skincare collection, you can take it or leave it. It really is about what you feel comfortable using. Um, and if you ever want to experiment with one of our eye creams or gels or any of our other products and you find, you know, it just doesn't work for me. I not seeing a difference, don't like taking the extra time to put it on when I'm not seeing any reward, um, send it back. You can send it back. Our products are 100% guaranteed. There is a time frame. I believe it's still set at 60 days, but that's you should know within two months, I would hope, whether you like a product or seeing a difference from it or not. Um, so that's good to know. So let me see what you guys are curious about in terms of eye area products. Um, definitely want to emphasize that sun protection on a daily basis is incredibly important. Generally speaking, the mineral sunscreen actives of titanium dioxide and or zinc oxide are the gentlest 
uh, for use around the eyes. They are the least likely to sting or burn if they get into the eyes, which can happen. We've all, I've gotten synthetic sunscreen ingredients in my eyes um, through sweating or just rubbing and it hurts. Um, sunglasses are also very important. Whenever you talk about sun protection and particularly sun protection for an area as delicate and vulnerable uh, to environmental damage as the eye area is, the more you can do to protect that skin, the better. So don't just stop with sunscreen. Get some sunglasses, wear them even when it's not sunny outside, but still kind of bright. Um, I'm one of those people that I can I actually would rather be outside without sunglasses on a sunny day than I would on an overcast day because that difference in the brightness just really bugs my eyes when it's overcast, but I can kind of adapt to it. I get bugged when it's sunny and it's too bright, but I can more easily adapt to that than when it's overcast. So I just, I, I have sunglasses with me whenever I'm outside, even during the winter. Um, but you want to find a pair, and this is a good tip, that blocks the light as much as possible from above and from the sides. So don't get sunglasses, these are my reading glasses, but don't get sunglasses that have the very thin side pieces with no protection right here. You leave this area vulnerable. Let me put my glasses on. If these were sunglasses, UV light would still be getting to this area here, right where the crow's feet show up. You don't want that. Um, sunscreen, even when you apply it liberally, even when you apply it before leaving your house, unfortunately, it is not a lead blanket. It's not 100% effective. Even the higher SPF still let about 2% of UV light through, and that can still be enough to trigger some damage. Obviously, much, much less, uh, and much better for your skin than going without sunscreen at all. But recapping, adding sunglasses to the equation really, really helps to, especially if you're dealing with dark circles, because a hidden trigger of dark circles that a lot of people aren't aware of, particularly if you don't have a genetic propensity for dark circles, is sun damage. Uh, that buildup of dead skin cells around the eyes and then the, the cumulative sun damage can cause texture, firmness, and color changes around the eye. And it may not, it may not be just skin pigment or melanin because uh, unprotected sun exposure damages your skin's vascular system, the, the network of blood vessels beneath the skin. If the circles you're seeing under your eyes are kind of a bluish purple or pinkish red color, um, almost reminiscent of a, of a fading black eye, by that I mean it's obviously not as dark as if you got a shiner, um, that is most likely vascular damage uh, and there can be a vascular and a melanin component that combine to create the coloration you're seeing under your eyes. So if just getting into this dark circle discussion here, and then I promise I'll get to questions. If you are someone who sees uh, that coloration under your eyes and when in your younger years, dark circles were never an issue, concealer, what concealer, um, that is most likely from sun damage. And starting to use a, a, a leave-on AHA or BHA exfoliant, using daily sun protection and using a brightening type product around the eyes can make a big difference. So that is really exciting because unfortunately, in terms of dark circles from genetics, there's still a, not a whole heck of a lot you can do. It's sad, uh, you, you can take the same measures I just spoke of, the leave-on exfoliant, sun protection, good brightening product, to keep those genetic dark circles from becoming darker due to environmental exposure. Um, but if you are genetically prone to dark circles and you want to um, you want to get rid of them, I wish I could say, yes, it's totally possible to 100% get rid of them and you know, aren't you gonna be the lucky one? Um, but it's not. You can get some degree of improvement with various in-office light emitting procedures but even the latest studies um, don't necessarily paint a, a, a rosy picture for that type of dark circle. So you, you, we're still kind of just uh, hitting a wall, so to speak, maybe about a 30 to 40 percent at best improvement in their appearance, but we can't get rid of them entirely yet. 
which is why if you are that one of those people uh, with genetic dark circles, um, you need to uh, figure out a great concealer because the right concealer applied correctly uh, can literally make dark circles disappear. Cosmetic effect, of course, it's makeup, but today's best concealers can really do a gorgeous job of making it look like you don't have any dark circles at all. And it isn't a situation where you're trading one uh, color contrast issue for another because the technology uh, as far as pigment has just improved leaps and bounds. Um, I mean, oh my gosh, when I was a teenager, it was like rubbing chalk under your eyes. Um, okay. Roel, let's get to the questions. Roel says, hi, Brian. Is it, tech is it technically possible to create a 2% salicylic acid product combined with 4% betaine salicylate for the EU market or is not conform regulations of such a product over I, it, um, From a chemistry standpoint, it's absolutely possible. You can combine salicylic acid and betaine salicylate. For those of you who don't know, betaine salicylate is essentially a derivative of salicylic acid that maintains many of its properties uh, when, pro when correctly formulated, meaning like right pH range, it's solubilized in the formula, um, you're avoiding denatured alcohol as your solvent because that's just going to irritate the skin. From a regulatory standpoint though, I am not up to speed on what the regulation in the EU market is on betaine salicylate and percentages. I know that uh, in, for example, the Korean market, Korea is a market that has tighter restrictions. The KFDA, the Korean version of the FDA, their own regulatory agency, they cap the amount of salicylic acid uh, permitted for use in leave-on products at 1%, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, if I'm wrong, someone correct me. That's last I knew. So, uh, and then they, I, I think they uh, put that same restriction on betaine salicylate because uh, we were at one point offering betaine salicylate products using higher percentages in that market and then we had to pull those products back because of regulatory changes. So uh, from a formulary uh, perspective, possible regulatory, I'm not quite sure. Jenny says, happy Thursday, Brian. After having a milia spot removed under my eye recently, I'm wondering if I can still use eye creams. Is it a myth eye creams cause milia? Um, I used to think that it was... That's a really good question. Paul and I have disagreed on this because I, her argument is, and she definitely has a point, that milia isn't just something that happens to adults. Another, uh, the, the lay person name for milia is closed comedone, unlike a, a blackhead where the comedone is open, which allows the sebum to oxidize. That's why a blackhead turns dark. Um, Amelia is a clogged pore that has a thin layer of skin on the top. That's why it's called a closed comedone. Um, depending on the contents inside that clogged pore, they can be incredibly stubborn. Uh, and, and as I'll, I suspect Jenny had to do, she went to a physician, perhaps a dermatologist, and had the milia lanced and then drained. Uh, and that, for some people, can be what is needed, skincare has limitations when it comes to milia. For some people, it work, skincare can work great. For others, it just doesn't doesn't give them the results that they want. And I, that's just the way it is. Um, so Paula, Paula pointed out to me when we were having this discussion that infants get milia, often uh, quite, a, quite a few around their eyes, but infants typically aren't using skincare and especially not eye creams. Um, so whether I do think that there is some truth to using heavier products around the eyes if you are milia prone and you see a pattern um, of more milia popping up when you're using creamier products and then you uh, you step back you take you you take steps to um, get rid of the milia whether through skincare or whether through a visit to a uh, dermatologist, and then you start using creamier products again and the bumps come back. Uh, there could be some cause and effect going on there. It could also be coincidental. I have not seen a study, a you know, comparative study type thing in, in the scientific literature indicating that 
For example, um, comedogenic ingredients or ingredients we tend to think of as being comedogenic, like your rich emollients, your lanolins, isopropyl myristate, things like that, that those are milia triggers. Um, what I would suggest, though, if you want to be cautious, is to use a lighter weight product, um, either an eye gel or, I said I was going to mention this, this has become my um, daytime eye area product, the Omega Plus Complex Eye Cream, because it has, it's, it's a cream, but it has that kind of slightly whipped texture, and it thins out nicely. Um, so I just do about, well, a little bit more than that. That's about how much I use, if you can see that, uh, around each eye. And I start at the outer area, and then I kind of work in just along the orbital bone. I don't put any eye area product too close to the eye itself, because especially for a cream-type product, once that warms to your body temperature, it is going to migrate a bit closer to the eye. You don't need to help what's going to happen naturally. Because uh, if you do put it too close to the eye itself, there's a risk of it getting into the eye. You could also get, um, depending on the thickness of the product and how long it has contact there, um, you could get what's called a sty, which is an inflammation of the hair follicle of the eyelash. And they can happen along the upper or the lower eyelash line. I believe they're more common along the lower eyelash line, uh, mostly because of the secretions. Um, of the eye. For some people, the composition of that can trigger uh, styes if, others, if other conditions are there. And styes hurt. I have had them before. Uh, it feels like a kind of a hot, angry little pimple. Uh, they can itch. Um, and then you don't want to constantly itch your eye because you could end up giving yourself conjunctivitis, which is also known as pink eye. And you've created another um, much more unsightly problem. I've had both. Uh, at the same time, and it's it's awful. <laughs> you like you literally want to wear an eye patch, and for some people that can help because when you have that patch over your eye and you go to you know scratch it, you're not going to get to the eye itself. Uh, anyway, that's what I would do, Jenny. I would start with thinner products and see how your skin responds, even if it means you have to like layer a lighter weight eye cream like the Omega. Uh, along with your thinner textured facial moisturizer to get to that level of moisture that your eye area may need. Um, experiment and, and let me know. Uh, some nice compliments. Triple X, triple X. In terms to rating what constituents would, uh, would you grade as the best when it comes to combat crow's feet would retin-A, retin-A even fit in? Um, there are crow's feet, which is the, the more common name for what looks like little bird prints. <laughs> I know, fun, huh? Uh, along, along the sides of the eye. They can be superficial or they can be deep. The more sun damage you have and the more expressive you are, um, the deeper they will be. Uh, some people refer to them as smile lines, which they can be. Smile lines, though, tend to be those um, smaller crinkles right at the corner of the eye. And when you smile... They, they, those wrinkles um, pop out more, but they also tend to go up, whereas crow's feet tend to go out. Uh, and then left unchecked, crow's feet, um, meaning like no sun protection, you keep tanning, you're smoking, you're not taking good care of your skin. Um, crow's feet can kind of feed into that cross-hatched wrinkling that occurs over the cheeks. And people typically in their late 60s through 70s and 80s that have a long history of sun damage. Um, have had a lot of environmental exposure and pretty much no UV protection. It's just, uh, and their skin takes on a leathery texture and that makes the wrinkles look even deeper. Um, as far as ingredients, though, for crow's feet, uh, first of all, you absolutely can use tretinoin or other prescription retinoids, say for adapalene, which is different. That's really more acne targeted and some would say Tazerac as well, Tazerotene. Um, but, but tretinoin, um, the over-the-counter retinoids, 1% uh, retinol, which we offer in a couple of our products. Other brands offer higher strength retinols as well. Um, there is some interesting research showing that at a 1% concentration, retinol's efficacy rivals that of the prescription forms of retinoid. Because on skin, retinol eventually breaks down to retinoic acid, which is the active form. That's exactly how the prescription form works. It's just that the prescription form um, takes less time 
to there's fewer conversion steps in the skin that have to happen for that retinoic acid to be uh, converted. So retinoid uh, treatment, retinoid therapy is definitely a gold standard for wrinkles anywhere on the face. I would also urge you to look into um, vitamin C, ceramides, retinol, various peptides. There are a lot, niacinamide. There are a lot of good ingredients to consider for use around the eyes. And um, for example, because eye area concerns tend to be, especially when you get into your 40s and 50s, they tend to be more pronounced than signs of aging concerns on the rest of the face. I think it uh, can be really beneficial for eye area products uh, to contain um, a bit of an extra boost or amount of those key ingredients. For example, our 10% niacinamide booster can absolutely be used around the eyes and can actually be really helpful if you have dullness or dark circle concerns. Uh, same for either the C25 Super Booster or the C15 Super Booster, which can be used around the eyes, either mixed in to your eye cream and then applied, or you can put one of those treatment products on first and then follow with your eye cream or facial moisturizer for that hydration aspect. Okay, moving on. How are we doing on time? Ooh, good. Anthony says, uh, oh, he's, okay, he's mentioning a Christmas song. He loves Mariah Carey's Oh Holy Night. He says that song is awesome. I agree. Beautiful arrangement of that song. In fact, just last night, I was listening to Mariah Carey's Christmas album, the album on, on vinyl. I went out and bought it on vinyl. Yep, I'm one of those people. Um, I don't have as much Christmas music, holiday music on vinyl as I do on compact disc because I've been collecting compact discs longer. Um, so when it comes to vinyl, I'm, I'm more selective. Um, first of all, I don't have the room for all of it. And uh, I really, with vinyl, because it's not, it's not as easy as just popping in a CD and then going about your business. You kind of have to pay more attention to vinyl, like, and oh, is side A over? I have to get up and flip it over um, to side B. It's just more of a concentrated effort to enjoy vinyl, which I think is good. But in order for me to buy a vinyl album, I really need to like the majority of the album. And the Mariah Carey album uh, is definitely one of them. One of my other favorite ones, um, is Christmas Portrait by the Carpenters because I think their Karen Carpenter is just one of the best female singers ever um, and her interpretation of a lot of those classic songs. You still hear them on the radio today. It's timeless. Okay, but back to skincare. Uh, Anthony says, is there any way to prevent the clinical eye cream from pilling? I've tried using a small amount, changing where in my routine I use it and how I apply it. It still pills. Frustrating. That is frustrating. I have not had that issue with it. Now, admittedly, I don't use that eye cream uh, as my mainstay. I do have it in my in my routine, and I'll throw it in every now and then. Um, I haven't, you know, I should check the reviews, the consumer reviews for this to see if that's that's been an issue, because typically if somebody says a product is pilling, they're not the only ones saying the product is pilling. Um, what you might want to try, though, Anthony, if you have either our oil booster or a little bottle of a non-fragrant plant oil. Try mixing, take, taking the usual amount of the clinical eye cream that you would apply and then mix a drop, no more than a drop, just because I don't want it to get all, I, I don't want it to get all um, greasy around your eyes. Uh, and then apply that and see if that helps with the pilling. The other thing that you could try is if you're normally like massaging it, in around the eye area, try just tapping it and just let it absorb naturally. Don't worry about working it into the skin by massaging or rubbing. Uh, just let it absorb on its own and see if that helps. Okay. Nancy says, uh, Clay Aikens, Mary, did you know? And Amy Grant's Breath of Heaven, Lorena McKennett, Seven Joys of Mary. Oh, lots of Christmas stuff. I um, I don't know the Lorena McKennett one. I, uh, I know who she is. Um, but in fact, I didn't even know she had a holiday album. Um, Jenny says, happy early birthday, Brian. One of our faves is Bruce Springsteen. Santa Claus is coming to town. <laughs> that is a good one. Um, my my uh, four-year-old son, Dashiell, um, calls that the rock and roll Santa song. And the other day when I was giving him a bath, as he was exiting the tub, he had to do the rock and roll Santa Claus is coming to town dance. And I'm 
kneeling there with the towel like, aren't you freezing? And he had to finish his dance before I could dry him off. It's interesting kid. Um, let's see. Uh, I think we got to that one. Nisi Pie. As an avid PC user, I never used eye creams, but I now use the Resist eye cream, and it has significantly plumped out the hereditary under eye crinkles I have. It is incredible. That is awesome to know. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, you know, sometimes at my age, um, particularly if my skin is looking more dehydrated, if it's been a long day, um, if I've if I've been traveling. Um, you know, you catch sight of yourself in the mirror and you notice that the lines around your eyes are all of a sudden more apparent, like, you know, and, and that is when I will layer this on, you know, that, the, that evening I'll make sure that, cause I think a, a big part of making those lines less apparent is keeping them plumped and hydrated and that, and the long lasting nature of this eye cream really helps with that. Um, it's not making those lines go away. I wish it would, um, but no eye cream can really do that. Um, the best we can do is give our skin those ingredients that um, can help to some extent repair the underlying damage, which will improve firmness, which will improve wrinkles uh, and fine lines. In fact, some people would say that their fine lines go away. Um, I don't think there's anything fine about lines, but no, I get, I'm kidding. I get the term. Um, a lot of that though is because the, if your eye area skin is really dry, you don't, and you don't have true wrinkles like from environmental damage, um, or even from facial expressions, which by the way, I haven't mentioned this yet, but in terms of crow's feet and wrinkles around the eyes, Botox is an option. Uh, you want to go to somebody who has had a good amount of experience injecting it around the eyes because it, 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 that is a trickier area. Uh, to treat um, depending on the extent of the wrinkles, but that can make a really big difference along with your topicals with your sunscreen and then um, some derms depending on how your eye area a little fuzzy there depending on how your eye area is aging some derms may also suggest a small amount of dermal filler to help um, if, if the area here if you haven't had the fat pad shift down, which can happen um, as we age and will happen to one degree or another for most of us. But if that hasn't slipped down yet and you're getting a little bit of hollowing under here, but you don't have that um, under eye bag, as they're often called, which that's needs to be corrected via surgery, unfortunately, not skincare. Um, a dermal filler, which is typically going to be hyaluronic acid, uh, can be injected in that tear trough area to um, base, I was plump up, but it kind of like, uh, from the underside, from, from the underneath up helps, um, improve that hollow look, which can happen due to lost facial volume. More common, uh, in the fifties and sixties in those decades, but it can occur sooner for some people. Okay. Uh, Ilsa says, happy birthday, Brian. Thank you for everything you do. It is my pleasure. Uh, Oh, Nisi Pai says she's 45 with no crow's feet, thanks to 14 years of Paula's choice. Feliz cumpleaños. Happy birthday. Erica, did I say that Spanish correctly? I hope so. I did take Spanish in high school. Uh, Karina Allen. Is that the Karina Allen? <gasps> it is. Oh, Karina. Hello. Karina uh, heads up Paula's choice Romania. Uh, and she's joined us today to say hello from your Romanian fans. I know some people will say it's no need for separate eye cream with SPF, but I would love to see a tinted eye moisturizer with a mineral SPF. That is something that we are going to start working on. Um, I don't know when, as far as when it's going to be available, because this that we've gone down this road before, and uh, it, it took a lot of doing, and I, I think I mentioned in one of the chats that we had a, we had an approved eye cream with sunscreen. It was going to be the daytime counterpart to the Resist eye cream. And so it would have been our third eye products. I think the gel had launched by then. And uh, it, it ran into um, stability issues um, shortly before launch and we had to pull it. It really, really, it was one of those um, 
projects that was just so discouraging. Uh, it was so discouraging to have to make that decision. And all of us had put so much effort into it that um, we just kind of wanted to let it rest for a while and, and not even talk about it again because it was just you know, so many hurdles and, and, you know, you pass that, pass that milestone and then to have that happen. And, and believe me, we did troubleshooting and we could not, <clears throat> we couldn't figure it out. Um, and, uh, there were some things that we weren't willing to negotiate on one of which that probably would have helped, uh, get to where we needed to be. But when one of them was, uh, accepting a lower SPF rating, we really wanted at least SPF 30, um, and yeah, long story, but we are going to go down that road again. I just don't know when I'm hoping sometime next year. So thank you for the question with a metal applicator, like the eye gel, I will note that Karina, no promises, but I will note it. Um, that metal applicator is really cool. I was just having dinner with friends last night and, uh, uh, all, all men. And one of the guys who is about 10 years older than me. Uh, has some puffiness and dark circles around his eyes. Pretty, pretty common um, for for a man his age that I know hasn't been uh, great about sunscreen uh, or sunglasses for that matter. And uh, the other friend had said that <clears throat> he's been using the anti-aging eye gel from Paula's Choice because he has um, he's one of those people that deals with puffy eyes in the morning. Um, so that it's most likely due to food retention and or allergies as opposed to what I mentioned earlier um, about under eye bags with the fat pads shifting beneath the skin. That type of age-related puffiness um, isn't really going to be helped by an eye gel no matter what it contains. You literally have to have um, a cosmetic surgeon take that fat pad beneath the skin and suture it back into its, or anchor it, as they say, back to its original place. And that can make a huge difference. It's a procedure called a blepharoplasty, and it can be done on the lower uh, eyelid or the upper eyelid because there's fat pads up here that for some people can start drooping and pooching out. And uh, for some, it can get to the point where it starts impacting their vision. Um, the nice part about that, if you have um, good insurance, is that um, that type of an issue, because it affects your vision, isn't considered cosmetic or elective. Um, it, it is a medically necessary procedure to make sure that you can still see. Uh, so insurance typically will cover that. So that's nice. Um, not that I, you know, you should look forward to that happening, but just as an FYI. Elizabeth says, hi, Brian. Overall, I'm quite happy with my skin with the exception of the skin under my eyes. When I smile, the skin looks like scrunched up tissue paper. Any suggestions? in terms of skincare or cosmetic procedures. So um, it is a combination. I, I firmly believe that as we get older and struggle with different signs of aging, some of which we can prevent, some of which we cannot, the best partnership is between great topical skincare that of course has to include sunscreen and the cosmetic corrective procedures um, and there's a menu of them, as you likely know, if you've looked into it, um, that you're comfortable having. And in terms of, so what you're seeing, uh, Elizabeth, is is likely, I, I think what you first need to address is texture. Um, I would, so from our line, I would start using um, the daily smoothing treatment with 5% glycolic acid, which you can use all over your face, including around the eyes, I would start using the peptide booster to really help boost not only um, uh, hydration, but also firmness. And then I think you'd really like our original anti-aging eye cream that you can pat on over that. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt that you've got a sunscreen in your routine and you're using that every day. So um, we don't need to talk any further about sun protection. In terms of what a dermatologist can do, it's it's it would it's an in person evaluation, and they would need to. Uh, I, I if it, if it were me, I would go to a dermatologist that offers both Botox and or Dysport, which is another injectable uh, that that um, paralyzes the muscles selectively. I mean, it's not like if you, if you inject too much, it'll it'll be a problem. But the um, the muscles. Uh, 
beneath the skin uh, are largely responsible for the formation of expression lines, which is why Botox on the forehead, uh, which I have not had in quite some time, but I have had in the past, uh, works so beautifully. Um, you, as Paula would say, you can't look surprised, but you'll look good. <laughs> Um, actually, when Botox is done artistically in the forehead, um, you absolutely, most derms will leave some amount of movement going on because otherwise it just, it looks oddly, if you, if it's overdone, it can almost make a person's face look like a wax figure because, you know, we're emotional beings. And if you all of a sudden can't show that emotion at all, but you know, your, your voice, your inflection, or your body language is saying otherwise, but your face isn't sinking. It just can be a little bit weird. But um, with a dermatologist that knows their way around a Botox needle and has had experience with that, that really does not need to be a concern. I don't mean to scare you off. But uh, Elizabeth, that is uh, that would be my recommendation for you. Jerry says, I have very sensitive skin, and the Omega moisturizer really stings my skin. I wonder which ingredients could be causing this reaction. Huh, that is, it's certainly a gentle formula. Let me pop over to our site. I have, uh, that's become, the Omega moisturizer has become my winter moisturizer uh, as we've been dealing with lower humidity here. And I've even been layering that over the water infusing electrolyte moisturizer just because I love how that feels. It's like giving your skin this big drink of, of water. It's really cool technology. Um, so, hmm. Looking at the ingredient list, you said it's, I mean, it, the C1315 alkane, which is a solvent, solvents, um, solvents help other ingredients penetrate into the skin better. Um, the C1315 alkane, it's a hydrocarbon ingredient. It's not known to be sensitizing, but it could be that the, uh, that and the butylene glycol, which is also a penetration enhancer, it could be that those two ingredients are carrying the um, some of the plant ingredients further into the skin. Um, I mean, it's really balanced in terms of the fatty acids. The omegas are all anti-inflammatory. I mean, you're, it's got olive oil in it and olive oil by itself. The fatty acid ratio can actually cause some barrier disruption, but it's completely a non-issue here because of all the other different oils it's blended with. Again, you're getting a nice balanced mix of, of fatty acids. The amino acids aren't known to be sensitizing. You're getting the cholesterol, the phytosphingosine. Um, the Rose of Jericho, that anis, uh, anastase Anastatica Haruchunita. See, I can't even say these ingredients, uh, but it's it's common name is Rose of Jericho. It could, that's a new one for us. Um, the Borhavia diffuser root we've used in several other products. Very anti-inflammatory. Very calming. Hmm. Sodium PCA. I think the sodium polyacrylate starch is used in too low. If that's not an irritating ingredient, some people have an issue with acrylates. Um, but the amount of it in that product is, is very, very low. Last but not least, it could be the preservative blend in this moisturizer, although it's a preservative blend that we use in many of our other products. So if, if you're not having a sensitized reaction to our other products with it, I don't know that I blame this one. So after reviewing that, um, I suspect it could be a sensitivity to the Rose of Jericho. Um, which is an antioxidant plant extract. This is the, the, the Omega Plus Complex Moisturizer is the only product in our line that contains that ingredient. Uh, I'm almost 100% certain of that. So have you tried the Omega Plus Complex Serum? I would move to that one from the moisturizer and see if that is better tolerated. Um, contact our client services team um, in the country where you bought the product and talk to them about an exchange. All right, Paulista says, Dear Brian, my daily on-the-go eye care is the new Defense SPF. Very nice. The Essential Glow gives a wonderful glow to this area. It also has a slightly lightening effect. 
very true. That is a very gentle mineral sunscreen. It is more, um, it is for all skin types, but it does have a uh, a creaminess to it. Um, my husband really likes that one. That is by far his favorite of our SPFs. Uh, he wears it every day. Um, and he does actually get compliments on his, you know, the glow his skin has, uh, which I'm sure he likes. It, but it's not, it's a healthy glow. Um, it's not a, it's not shimmery. It doesn't look like makeup. Um, it just makes your skin look healthier. Um, and we added that not only because we thought it looked good, but the um, amount of mineral actives, it can be a little bit tricky. Sometimes on certain skin tones, particularly medium to dark skin, um, the mineral actives, unless you're using some iron oxide um, for pigmentation, uh, meaning giving color to the product, with, without those, the mineral actives can be a little um, grayish on the skin. All right, let me pop open or over real quick and shut my door. My little guy got home a little early and he usually comes into the office here and, and says hello. So I just wanted to tell him that he had to wait because we're still live. We're still going. We're still answering questions. Um, oh, Elizabeth, thank you. Yep. She says she's using sunscreen like a madman. Excellent. Uh, Monica, I think we're on to her question. Happy holidays, Brian. Merry Christmas. Ooh, and happy birthday. You look wonderful just as you are on the inside. Oh, thank you. Here I thought, here I thought there was a question on eye creams coming and it was just a nice compliment. <laughs> Stephanie says, is it okay to keep two boosters in the same container? For example, I love the niacinamide booster and hyaluronic acid booster. I have thought about putting them in the same container just to make my morning routine even faster and easier, but I wasn't sure if this would change the efficacy of either product. It it might. Um, it's, not, it's not that you can't combine those ingredients. It's just that those individual products have been stability tested in terms of their complete formulas. Um, the formula in bulk. Uh, has been stability tested and then the formula has been stability and compatibility tested in its its each one's respective component. So my concern is that if you're bringing in an all new component, I, I, know, I know there are options out there, but depending on what it's made of, you know, and, and all of that, and then there could be compatibility issues between both formulas and whatever you want to put it in to mix them. Uh, and then there could be um, formulary issues with combining them into one product that you're then going to have sitting around for a while. Um, so it isn't something that we typically advise. Um, I, I mean, I, I get wanting to streamline your routine. What you could, uh, what you could look at doing is putting one of those boosters on during the during the day and use the other one at night. Um, basically, you know, cut out a step. Um, but if you don't want to do that. Uh, I, I think it's worth it. I think it's worth the, the little bit of extra the little bit of extra time it takes to apply them, um, keep them in their respective individual containers, and apply them one after the other. Uh, Monica says, "Mind your eye concerns are the hereditary South Asian dark circles. I use the new ceramide eye cream to help with discoloration and hyperpigmentation, plus daily sunscreen. Should I try the new Omega eye cream too?" Um, <clears throat> I, I, I hate discouraging people from trying anything that's new that they're curious about and they think might work for them because Lord knows I do. Um, but the clinical ceramide enriched firming eye cream is our heaviest hitting eye cream in terms of the, uh, that's got the most potent bioactive ingredients thanks to its, it's got a really nice slug of multiple types of vitamin C plus retinol, plus the ceramides, plus some additional antioxidants. So I think that um, the Omega Plus Complex eye cream, I mean, for lack of a better description, it's it, I'm not knocking that formula at all. I, mean, I use it, but it's not as anti-aging. So if I, I am not somebody that has discoloration, um, under eye discoloration concerns, at least not yet. 
uh, and I don't have hereditary dark circles. Um, so if it were, if I was in your situation, I think you're using the exact eye cream from us that you should be. Um, if anything, if you wanted to experiment with another one, I think the anti-aging eye cream from Resist would be an interesting one because that has uh, an antioxidant complex led by an ingredient called troxrutin, which has some interesting research on helping to fade the look of vascular type discoloration. Um, however, um, to, again, because I don't want you to be disappointed by trying this one, if you are fairly certain that the nature of your dark circles is um, melanin uh, as opposed to vascular, then I don't know that you'd see quite the same improvement with the Resist Anti-Aging Eye Cream that you would with the Clinical uh, Enrich Firming Eye Cream because the multiple forms of vitamin C and the retinol in that eye cream uh, are excellent for um, under eye discoloration due to sun damage. Okay, that was my very, very long answer. Uh, Kim B says, regarding an earlier comment on the Omega Moisturizer, my skin seems to really enjoy that product, but I get definite stinging with the Omega Serum. Hmm. You know, I always wonder, um, the, the whole issue of product stinging, uh, it's, it's something that actually we were just discussing this afternoon. Um, it can be really maddening both as the consumer experiencing it and um, from the business side as as the company that is striving to make the best possible products and you know we we can put together a formula and and look at the individual studies on the ingredients and say um, you know wow look at look at what a great antioxidant this is look at how calming this is whatever the situation may be whatever the benefit is and yes we want to use that in this product in this amount what doesn't exist, and this is pretty much true for any skincare product, is a comprehensive study that looks at um, what the combination of ingredients is going to do for skin overall. All we can do is pull the individual studies for ingredients or ingredient blends uh, and then combine that with, of course, cosmetic chemistry knowledge and uh, you know, deal, work with ingredient suppliers, talk to the other chemists we work with about compatibility, and create the best possible products that we know how to make. Um, but it, it's, uh, we will sometimes have situations where we test a product and um, we will do a, a smaller panel test, like, and by small I mean like 30 people, and there will be not a single report of an adverse reaction. And then we extend it to a larger group of people and uh, maybe 5% will have some level of adverse reaction. Um, stinging can happen, maybe a little redness, but stinging or a burning sensation is probably the most common. Um, the other thing that can be frustrating about that, it's, uh, it's almost like trying to figure out what will it or won't, will it or won't it make me break out because it's multifactorial. Um, it's, you can look at the ingredients and try to pinpoint, well, as I was doing earlier, what might be the problem. Um, for example, for the Omega Moisturizer, I called out the Rose of Jericho because it's a new ingredient for us. Uh, and, and that is an example of a formula that on paper, it's just not irritating. I mean, it's like, what in this is going to irritate anybody's skin unless they have an individual sensitivity to one or more of the ingredients. But then, and I didn't get into this in the answer, you also have to consider what else is the person using? Is it something in that product, that, that single product, or is it the combination of that product and something else in their routine? Um, or is it just an individualized reaction? And it can be, in many cases, it can be impossible to know um, because even if you stop using the product, and start using something else that doesn't cause a reaction. It doesn't mean that you won't experience that type of a stinging reaction to that new product that initially worked great. See what I mean? It really, it drives us nuts because I know personally how much work goes into creating the, the most irritant free products we can. And even when we're using ingredients that uh, for a good amount of people can cause some level of irritation, retinol being the classic example, even then we strive to 
use um, encapsulation technology, uh, controlled release, uh, a whole battery of soothing agents to help to help ward off any of that from happening so that when you use the products we make with more bioactive ingredients like retinol, you will only see great results. You won't have to you know, go through that uh, hurdle of what some dermatologists call retinol dermatitis as skin uh, acclimates to that ingredient. Um, that can be a fact for some people and then some people just can't use retinol in any amount at all because of an individual sensitivity to it. So, all right, one more. Uh, fear of a name says, can you explain the difference between dry skin and dehydrated skin? Do they get treated by different products? Uh, we have a whole article on this uh, on uh, polystroids.com in the expert advice section. But to give you the Cliff Notes version, uh, dry skin tends, dry skin is a classic skin type, uh, typically. Uh, that is skin that either doesn't produce enough of its own oil, sebum, or it's producing enough sebum, but because of barrier disruption or some level of barrier damage, the skin is not able to hold on to and or balance its moisture levels. So you got the oil, but your skin doesn't quite know what to do with it, and it doesn't know how to hold on to the balanced hydration, which involves water, water transport, ceramides, glycerin, hyaluronic acid, on and on and on. Doesn't know how to keep that uh, where it should be in skin or it can't hold on to it as well. It's not making as much as it used to. Those can all be hallmarks of dry skin. And then that kind of bleeds into dehydrated skin. Dehydrated skin is typically brought on by seasonal changes, irritating skincare products, um, those are, those are the, the, the two, the two biggest things that can cause dehydrated skin. Dehydrated skin is really more about, uh, skin not having enough, uh, water, whereas dry skin is really about skin, uh, not being able to hold on to what it needs to keep itself, uh, from feeling dry. So it perpetually feels dry. Uh, as soon as you wash your face, you're reaching for that moisturizer, Dehydrated skin tends to be transient, it tends to come and go, and it can be a problem even if you have oily skin. You can have oily and dehydrated skin. So I need to wrap up because we're going a little long. Check out the article we have on dry versus dehydrated skin on paulschoice.com. Thank you guys uh, so much for joining me today and all of your questions. I will be back in January, so I wish all of you a beautiful healthy holiday season. And I hope that 2020 is your year. Um, and I know from all of you who've been with us, uh, hanging out with us and, and supporting Paula's Choice, you know, you're, you're just maintaining that great skin and we've got more in store for you next year.